So my name is Rob Irving. I'm a senior software engineer for PAR Government Systems. Uh, I'm Jason Turner, and I'm independent. So if you know anyone wants to hire me or contract, <laughs> let me know. And uh, we're the host of CPP Cast, which is a C++ podcast we started about a year and a half ago. Um, guessing if you're in this room, you probably listened to a couple episodes. Maybe. That's a good question. Raise your hand if you have heard of the podcast. Okay. okay. <laughs> so we're going to talk about what we learned from the community today, but first I just want to give a quick introduction about what the podcast is. Um, I often get asked when I'm at conferences and whatnot why I started the podcast. And the simple answer is because no one else did. Uh, a more elaborate answer is I used to listen to a lot of podcasts myself. I had a one hour commute. And one podcast I listened to was .NET Rocks. They're up to like 1,200 episodes now, I think. So I was going through their backlog. And I got to one episode where they interviewed Kate Gregory, who was a well-known C++ speaker. And after listening to that episode, I thought it was great. You know, I'd really like to listen to this type of stuff more often as a C++ developer. So I looked around for other C++ co podcast content and didn't really find anything. I found a handful of other specific podcast episodes. Kate Gregory did two shows on that .NET Rocks show. And I found one episode with Herb Sutter uh, on Hansel Minutes, another one with Scott Myers on a podcast called uh, Hello World. And that was really it. Um, you can see up here I have a link to uh, a list of software development podcasts that's kept pretty up to date. And if you look there, there's about five Microsoft.NET podcasts, uh, dozen or so JavaScript and web development podcasts, but there was nothing for C++. And that really frustrated me, so I decided to start a C++ podcast. I thought the community could use it. So for the past year and a half, uh, we've recorded 70 episodes, speaking to various C++ authors, speakers. 70? 70 episodes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and library developers. And we've had a really great time doing the show and uh, learning from the C++ community. So today we just wanted to share some of the lessons we've learned over the past year and a half. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jason. So to be fair, I've only been there for like 63, if you include the one I was interviewed in, yes. <laughs> episodes. So uh, the first thing I wanted to call attention to is reverse debugging is amazing. Are you guys familiar with reverse debugging? A anyone? All right. So. We've actually interviewed two different people involved with re, uh, reverse debugging. Greg Law from UndoDB. Undo is here sponsoring the conference, and they sponsored us for a while, but that's not why I'm, why I'm mentioning them. And uh, Robert O'Callaghan is his uh, RR reverse debugger, um, which I don't know how visible that really is. But anyhow, um, it, it's a Mozilla project, or was a Mozilla project. And the idea is that you can run your program and record its execution, and then just like you might do next in your debugger, if you want to step through, you can do reverse next and actually step backward through the program's execution and see like what the variable states were. So you could get a sig fault and then step backward and find out why the sig fault happened. It's it's an incredible technology. Uh, you should totally check out like some of the videos. Both of these projects have videos demonstrating how they work. I want to talk a little bit about C++ on the web. Um, as a C++ developer, I recognize that it's being used in browsers. It's being used by you know, lots and lots of apps access the web and communicate over the web. But all the web apps that we see on a day-to-day -day basis are all JavaScript and HTML. There's definitely a disconnect, I think, between the C++ and the web. But I think WebAssembly has the potential to break down that barrier and give C++ devs the ability to write for the web. Um, I'm pretty excited by this. It should bring new opportunities to C++ developers and bring faster, more high-performing apps to the web because obviously C++ is going to be a lot faster than JavaScript. Um, this episode that we did with uh, JF Bastian from Google came out a year ago, and it was right after, two weeks after the initial WebAssembly proposal. So it's come a lot, long way since then, 
There's going to be a talk tomorrow, uh, not by JF, but by Dan Goman, who I believe is from Mozilla, uh, tomorrow at 445. And he's going to show uh, what WebAssembly looks like today and hopefully what you can start writing with. Uh, another episode we did that relates to C++ and the web was more recent. Uh, we had Alfred from ImpluteOS. And ImpluteOS, has anyone heard about it? They did talk yesterday. Yeah. It's a, a library operating system, which means your application is going to include the OS and basically statically link in everything you need to run on hardware. It, it's difficult to understate if I can interrupt yeah. real quick. It's, it's literally a single header include. Pound include and you have a bootable C++ program. Yeah. So it seems pretty amazing. Um, they uh, demoed yesterday at their talk that uh, they created Acorn, which is a, uh, a web hosting platform. Yeah, 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 it's a web server. Web server for uh, C++. And they've talked about other use cases that could potentially happen, like uh, writing your own microservices with RESTful APIs. And in their talk yesterday, uh, they showed how their demo ones are already outperforming, what Node.js can do. Yeah, and it's and, completely and unoptimized. Yeah, there's a lot of work they could do there. Uh, Apache outperforms yes. Apache for raw connections per second also. Yeah. So we did a pretty deep dive in the episode with Include OS, and uh, yeah, it's just really exciting technology and just is a new uh, opportunity, I think, for C++ developers. Have you ever had a Sean Parent moment? This is fun. <laughs> you, you have, Marshall? <laughs> so, um, oh, I don't actually have any details up there. Here, you can have that back. Um, we were interviewing Kate, and, and it was, it's a great interview. If you haven't heard it, um, well, you should. Yeah. Um, and she said that you know she was working on some project, and then she said, aha, I had a Sean moment. And, uh, and then I, I was in uh, C++ Now in, um, in May, and I was talking to Sean, and he said he was listening to that episode, and he goes, what the heck is a Sean moment? <laughs> and his wife was like, what's a Sean moment? He's like, I don't know. So it's that moment when you realize the wor you're working too hard, basically. That you, like, you have this much code and realize, actually, a standard algorithm or two could minimize it down to like one line of code. So if you haven't seen Sean's C++ seasonings talks, everyone familiar with these things? They've already been mentioned at the conference a couple of times. Go watch them. They're excellent. <laughs> So next thing I want to talk about was uh, C++ for the next generation. Uh, a lot of times when we're doing the show uh, and we introduce a guest, we ask them how they got started in programming. And we get a lot of pretty interesting answers. Uh, we've had guests tell us they self-taught themselves C++. <laughs> in high school. In high school. <laughs> we've had guests tell us uh, you know, they were growing up in the 70s or 80s. They uh, were writing assembly out of magazines, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't have a great story myself, uh, maybe because I'm a little bit younger. Um, I did do some HTML in school. I wrote a kind of crappy Star Wars fan site. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. And uh, I didn't write, do any real programming until high school when I took a basic class. And then in college, I did C and C++ in my freshman year. So I now have two kids of my own, uh, age five and eight. And I'd really like to introduce them to programming at an earlier age so maybe they could have some of those cool stories about learning programming. So uh, one episode I want to talk about was Kate Gregory again. She's really uh, one of her favorite guests. And uh, when she was talking about Stop Teaching C, she mentioned that she had uh, two kids of her own and she taught them C++ at age 13. And these kids are adults now. So when she was teaching them you know, about a decade ago roughly, it must have been C++ 98. And with modern C++, I think you could introduce you know, kids of that age or kids at an even younger age to C++. And it could be their first language. I don't see why it couldn't be. Um, especially with things like game development libraries, uh, Cinder and SFML should really make learning C++ a lot more exciting for a kid. What kid wouldn't love to make their own video game? It's pretty cool. 
Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention uh, is if this is a topic that interests you, teaching C++ to the next generation, whether you have your own kids or not, you might want to look into code.org. They have their day of code every year, and they're always looking for volunteers who could come out to a middle school or a high school and teach C++. Um, I also wanted to call out a couple of uh, pretty exceptional younger guests we've had. Uh, I think some of them might be in the room. So that was Is Vittorio here? Uh, <laughs> might be here. <laughs> Uh, Vittorio Romeo, as Jason mentioned earlier, self-taught himself C++ as a teenager. And he either just graduated university or he's in his last year. And he's been writing open source C++ video games and doing uh, modern C++ game dev tutorials. Oops. While uh, still in university. Uh, another guest to mention is Jonathan Mueller. We had him on more recently. He's just going into his first year of college, but he has a very popular C++ blog, and he's already written, I think, five C++ libraries. I don't know. Yeah. Enough. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think I, I thought I had a comment on, oh yeah, we didn't realize when we went to interview uh, Jonathan, or if we're pronouncing it correctly in German, Uniton, but, uh, he, he, we didn't realize that he had literally just graduated from high school when we had him on the show. It was, yeah. it was pretty crazy. Yeah. And if I can turn this on you for just a second, Rob, since you've never been interviewed on the show, you just mentioned that your first programming was in BASIC in high school. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what were you programming on? What, kind of, what dialect of BASIC oh, do you remember? It was a PC. I really don't remember too well, though. What year was that? I'm 32, so I was like 17 or 16 at the time. I'm not sure. 15 years ago, two thousands. Yeah. Wow, oh, he's young. <laughs> <laughs> so this comes uh, from our uh, Alex Andrescu, Andre, um, when we interviewed him, episode 32. I uh, was trying to, to get some details about how D and C++ can interoperate. What is the story there? And um, I learned in comments afterward that people thought that I was just trying to get him to specific, specifically tell me if Qt worked with D, but that's not really what I was going for. I wanted to know the details of how D and C++ could talk to each other. And uh, they had been apparently debating in the community that they needed to like really understand C++ to be able to interoperate with it. So you would need to have C++ namespaces and C++ rules and templates and all of these other things. But, uh, so they had been thinking about that road for a long time and then he realized he was part of the C++ community and the D community and multiple language communities and realized that like all these communities were, were getting it wrong. All they really need to do was think of it as a name mingling and a layout problem. So if you can handle C++ name mingling appropriately for the platform and compiler that you're on, and know how the memory model for C++ works, then magically your D and C++ interoperability just works to some extent. There's uh, you know, other things like exceptions that have to be sorted out, but as, uh, so he, you know, he commented, which was my title slide here, that the whole community can miss the point. And it's, I guess, kind of ironic, as Rob pointed out, that we're in a discussion about the C++ community. So don't miss the point, I guess. <laughs> so that's really it. Um, we wanted to leave some room for questions. Uh, we also wanted to point out that there's gonna be a community building session tomorrow. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about C++ communities, C++ user groups, that might be a session you want to go to, like a panel worth going to. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention is we're always looking for new guests on the show. If you're here at CppCon, chances are you're somewhat of an expert in something. So feel free to reach out to us and uh, we can have you on the show to talk about C++ sometime. Or even if you're not an expert in anything, it can still be fun to have you on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and. I would like to say, just in fact, that I recognize many people in the room that I've been trying to get on this show. So <laughs> if you want to come talk to me or us afterward. 
Yeah, so we have plenty of time for questions. And uh, if you ask a question, we have some t-shirts to give away too. Everyone loves swag. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's uh, pretty easy to set up. Oh, sorry. The question was, uh, how do you go about recording an episode? Um, we get in touch with a guest, set a time. Jason and I work together on setting up a series of discussion topics, news articles we're going to bring up, and send that to the guest, usually like two days before the interview. We try for two days, yeah. Yeah. And then we just jump on Skype. Um, there's freely available recording software that we use to record the call. And uh, I do some post-process editing afterwards, but it's really a pretty easy process. For some inexplicable reason, my mic likes to cut out. So probably once or twice an episode in general, we get lots of, all right, Jason, we can't hear you anymore. Yeah. And we have to wait for my mic to come back. And that gets edited out, so you guys missed that fun. Yeah. By the way, I do want to apologize to everyone for some of our less than stellar editing in early episodes. Um, I listened to a couple of our old episodes while preparing notes, and uh, some of it was cringeworthy. So I apologize for making you all listen to that. I'm going to try to be better and better at editing. So that's just a recommendation. If you haven't listened to any of them, start at the beginning and work your way forward. You don't want to go backward in quality. Yeah. It's not worth it. <laughs> you have a yeah. blooper blue reel? <laughs> we do not have a blooper reel. Um, no, that just winds up on the editing room floor. <laughs> that would be yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, I, I know, the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, would you consider moving the server to C++? Yeah, right now uh, we post everything on GitHub. I don't even remember what it's called. Some JavaScript library turns uh, all our pages into HTML, static HTML. If someone made a similar tool for C++, I'd definitely be up for using it. And I know Alfred from Include OS talked to us about maybe getting our website up there. Yeah. I think yeah. there's yeah at least one C++ content management system being worked on in this room. <laughs> yeah. So can you share with us what's going to be in upcoming episodes and then people you get requests for a lot that you've been trying to get on? The question was what's going to be in upcoming episodes. Um, we usually record an episode and publish it like two days later or one day later. So we don't have content in the bag weeks from now. Uh, we do have guests scheduled. Um, two or three? Yeah, we have like two or three guests scheduled for the next few weeks. Um, I know one is Guy Davidson. Yes. I can't remember the other one. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, please feel free to recommend guests. Uh, we're always looking for recommendations. That's the main way we get guests on the show, just by someone asking us to interview them. I think at this point we've had most of the most requested guests, if you will, because we got Scott and Herb and uh, and Andre mm -hmm. and you know those are people that people know and people wanted to hear on the podcast. Yeah. If uh, theoretically I'd never heard of your podcast before, uh, what episode would you recommend I listen to to hook me so that I then come back? Well, I'll let you answer that one. Well, the question was, uh, <laughs> what episode would you recommend to hook me into the podcast? Um, we've had a lot of great ones. Uh, I know I was talking to a listener the other day, and he recommended Hartmut Kaiser when we were talking about parallelism. And that was an early episode. That was the first one you were on. It was the first one I was on. And it was a very good episode, yeah. I thought. Not just because I was there. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you learn how to talk about C++ without a whiteboard or video or reference? So. How did you guys fall upon the format? Or how did you, Rob, fall upon the format? And have you been tweaking it over time? Maybe we're still learning? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think we have a good question, answer to that question. So Richard just came up here just to get a, a sticker. I see what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? It is tricky, though. I would like to comment on that briefly. Sometimes yeah. we. I, you know, Rob will be talking with the guest, or I'll be talking with the guest, and I'm sure you do the same thing. You're sitting there making notes like, okay, how can I get further, deeper into this topic 
without going completely off the reservation and, and having no idea what people are talking about on the air. One thing I'll say is, you know, I think podcasts are kind of a passive way of listening to content where you listen to the episode and if it's something that really interests you, go and see if there's a CPPCon talk about it that you can watch on YouTube for more information or go read some blog posts about it. You know, we're just a way of introducing you to some new ideas that maybe you didn't hear of already. Yeah. How has hosting the podcast helped you in your C++ journeys yourself? How has hosting the podcast helped us with our C++ journeys? Uh, personally, for me, I am way more on top of news than I would otherwise be. I'm subscribed to every C++ news feed I am aware of. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm definitely following a lot more uh, C++ community news than I would have previously. I'm more aware of, you know, because we have to research every topic we're going to have on the show to some yeah. extent to make questions for it. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, are there subjects you think we should cover more? Are there subjects that we think we should cover more? I don't, I don't know any particular subjects. I, I know one comment we regularly get from listeners is that we should do more technical, deeper stuff. And as we already discussed, that's difficult to do without a whiteboard or something. But as far as I know, that's the most requested thing that people ask us for. We, we also frequently get requests for doing more intro level oh, C++ yes, that's content. Right. Yeah, and uh, we're. We had a, another panel earlier today that I went and attended um, where they were mentioning how user groups, it's hard to get intro level content. So I guess the same applies to us. Um, but if anyone's a C++ professor or something and they'd want to come on the show, I think that'd be great. Yeah, that could be cool. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so the question was, would we ever consider doing like an IRC chat or a Google Hangout while doing the podcast? And it's something I've thought a little bit about, but our schedule is really erratic. Yeah. Um, most of the time, Wednesday at noon is when we record. Wednesday at lunchtime, Eastern Coast. East yeah. Coast, yeah. But that can vary, because if we're talking to someone on the West Coast, then that might be too early for them, and we wind up talking to them at like 9 p.m. my time. Um, so it's just very erratic. I'm, I'm not sure if listeners would be willing to keep up with our schedule. Yeah. yeah. Well, on a side note, if you want something like that, John Kolb is, is doing his uh, live CBP yeah. chat. Yeah, John Kolb has CBP chat, which is a Google Hangout. And I know you're Well, not anymore stuff. because Google Hangout just got shut down. Oh. Or Google Hangout Live thing, so he has to move to YouTube Live or whatever. Oh, okay. But soon. <laughs> How's our Anything time? Else? All right. Well, thank you for your time today.